Hello, welcome to CSC 239, Cyber Law and Ethics. Today we're going to be talking about sex crimes on the internet. They are unique and distinctly involve the internet as part of the criminal activity. <clears throat> Before we get started, I just wanted to go over a case that was just in the news. Um, Jane Doe versus David Elam II. In 2013, Jane Doe broke up with her boyfriend, David, in California. Over the next year, David posted sexual photographs and videos of her on pornography websites and impersonated her in online dating forums. He also freely distributed her home address, her cell phone number, and her email addresses, which led to strangers constantly contacting her for sex. In 2014, Jane Doe civil suit against Elam in the United States District Court in California to get him to stop. In April 2018, the court awarded Jane Doe $6.4 million in one of the biggest judgments ever in a so-called revenge porn case. The judgment included $450,000 for copyright infringement, um, and Jane Doe had wisely copyright, copyrighted all of her photos, $3 million for severe emotional distress, and $3 million for other damages, including stalking and online impersonation with intent to cause harm. Jane Doe's case was handled by the, civil, the Cyber Civil Rights Legal Project, an initiative started in 2014 by k &L Gates, a Pittsburgh law firm, to sue for online harassment and the non-consensual posting of explicit material often involving a former girlfriend or spouse. So what this case is telling us is that you have very you have people who are just not ready to let go and they're going to harass and stalk and torment you as much as they can on the internet and just in the last few years have we really been seeing that these cases now are going to a trial are getting um, some kind of punishment and the reality is that David Elam the second who probably doesn't have 6.4 million will default on the judgment and every five years it'll re be renewed and every five years he will default but what happens in this case is now that it's on record, if he starts to harass her again, further steps can be taken of a more um, judicious nature in terms of criminal court. <clears throat> so let's talk about these cyber issues and how we uh, see these sex crimes. Stalking someone, harassing an ex, or being obsessed with revenge has been part of life way before the internet was even conceived. However, the internet makes it much easier to harass, stalk, and attempt to blackmail their victims. In this presentation, we're going to examine various forms of cyber harassment, revenge porn, child porn, and slut shaming, and most importantly, we will see how laws vary from state to state. That's going to be the second part of the presentation, which we're going to talk about next week. But for today, I want to address the actual crimes and the toll it takes on people. So let's start off with our definition of cyber sex. This is the pursuit of sexual arousal using computer technology, usually by watching pornography, webcam chatting, or by exchanging messages or pictures with another person via the internet. This is not an illegal activity. In a study by ABC News in 2004, it was estimated that 30% of adults who had used the internet had engaged in some aspect of cyber sex in the previous 12 months. Young men between the ages of 18 and 24 have the highest degree of cyber sex at 53%. This little cartoon over here on the right is absolutely dead on accurate in terms of you never know who you're chatting with online. So top picture you have this big burly man 
and he says, I've got long blonde hair up to my breasts. My bread mouth is juicy. And, of course, the person he's actually chatting with is a scrawny guy who says, Oh, Rita, my muscled body is shaking of desire. I want you now. So, you know, men who would never consider having sex with another man are probably having cyber sex with other men, not realizing it because the other man is calling himself Bambi. So let's get into the stuff that's not legal. So we're going to start with cyber sexual harassment, which is sexual harassment on the internet, and it can occur in a number of ways. A common form of sexual harassment on the internet occurs when a harasser sends unwanted, abusive, threatening, or obscene messages to a victim via email or instant messaging. Another common form of cyber sexual harassment occurs when a victim is subject to unwanted, abusive, threatening, or obscene messages and or comments on internet forums, blogs, and discussion boards. So we're going to break down sexual harassment on the internet into three very general types. We have one, gender harassment, two, sexual coercion, and three, unwanted sexual attention. Gender harassment occurs when a person bothers another person based on their gender or gender identity. It usually involves stereotypes based on the roles and functions associated with a particular gender, using stimuli known or intended to provide negative emotions. Verbal gender harassment is usually spoken offensive messages including gender humiliating comments, rape threats, and sexual remarks which are unwelcome and are neither invited nor consensual. When we say verbal, we mean typed out. Um, these are any kind of word-based harassing remarks. Then there's graphic gender harassment, which refers to the intentional sending of erotic, pornographic, lewd, and lascivious images and digital recordings by a harasser to a specific or potential victim. Graphic harassment often occurs via email, instant messaging, social media, and pop-ups. So, this lovely lady on the right is Kathy Sierra. She is a master Java instructor at Sun Microsystems and a game designer who also ran a programming blog. Just in case you're not familiar, Java is one of the big, big programming languages. And to become a master Java instructor, you need to be super smart and super accomplished in your field. So this woman is the bomb. In 2007, anonymous users posted on her blog that she deserved to have her throat slit, be suffocated, sexually violated, and hanged. In addition to disclosing her home address and social security number, they posted Photoshop pictures of Sierra. One picture showed her with a noose behind her neck and another showed her screaming while being suffocated by lingerie. After the attacks, Mrs. Ms. Sierra canceled her speaking engagements and feared leaving her home. After years of being mostly absent from the open internet, in July 2013 she started the site Serious Pony, which also included a, a blog. Not surprisingly, the gender harassment has in fact continued. Now, the gentleman who did disclose her home address and social security number was arrested and convicted, but the reality is there are dozens of these trolls who go after women on the internet who are in high-level programming and systems analysis jobs because, and we're going to talk about this in more detail, they resent a woman getting this love accomplishment. Next we're going to talk about sexual coercion is when a various means are used online to obtain sexual cooperation by placing pressure on a victim. This pressure is often achieved by the use of explicit threats or harm directed towards the victim or the relatives and friends of the victim. 
Now this is a very sad example. This young man on the right is a 17 year old boy from Scotland who was targeted by a group operating from the Philippines and was tricked into taking part in an explicit Skype chat. He believed that he was talking to a girl of the same age in the United States. However, he was then blackmailed by the offender demanding money who threatened that if he failed to pay his naked images would be posted on the social networking sites that he belongs to. And sadly, this young man committed suicide. So a lot of times people are tricked. They think they're talking to someone their own age, but the reality is they're not. They're talking to some disgusting old man who is planning to use this material to blackmail you. Then we have unwanted sexual attention. And this occurs when a harasser uses direct personal communication to harass a victim. Generally, the harasser uses personal communication to convey messages directly relating to sex and or sexuality which are unwanted or unwelcome by the victim. Such messages often refer to the victim's sex organs, their sex life, refer to inanimate objects, impose sex-related images or sounds, or insinuate or offer sex-related activities. This type of harasser who uses unwanted sexual attention to harass a victim online intends to solicit sexual cooperation from his or her victim either on the internet or in person. So, you know, basically it's that person who comes on really heavy and you're like, dude, I'm not interested, and he then sends you a picture of his penis. So, one of the most common examples is unsolicited pictures of men's sexual organs or messages meant to appeal, and I use that in quotes, to women. There is an entire Instagram account devoted to women posting unsolicited messages from men, and if you're interested in checking out that Instagram account, it's called By Felipe. So here's a couple examples. There's uh, one on the left, and it's, uh, hey there, how's your week going? And the person responds, it'd be a lot better with my wiener in your mouth. And the person responds, your wiener, wow. And the gentleman, I assume, since he has a wiener, says too much. And of course, he spelled too incorrectly. Um, and it's the response is, I mean, how on earth could a girl turn down an offer like that? So he says, so you want to get it in? And then she says, that was sarcasm. I'm going to pass. So again, it's this idea of, you know, it, this could be a 14-year-old boy saying this who's just, you know, got hormones coming out the brain or a 40-year-old man or any number of different age persons who just harass women and have all this sexual energy that they want to explore but they can't find somebody who likes their particular style. Now the one on the right, the gentleman says, wow beautiful eyes. Girl responds, aw thank you I used to get made fun for them when I was a kid. And the gentleman refer responds, you're welcome. Aw kids are mean. How's your day going? Can you deep throat? So again, what we're seeing here is, you know, instead of romance and instead of, you know, getting to know someone, they go right for the lowest common denominator. So moving on to revenge porn is sexually explicit images or videos of a person is po are posted on the internet usually by a former sexual partner without their consent in order to cause them distress or embarrassment. An anonymous stalker or hacker may unlawfully gain access to a victim's intimate photographs. Consequently, some victims prefer the term non-consensual pornography. The term revenge pornography can be misleading because not all culprits are motivated by revenge. Some individuals distribute explicit content to earn money through their sale and others are motivated by notoriety or entertainment. You know, that troll concept of this is going to really mess up people so I think it's funny. Um, some, some statistics from the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative. 
90% of revenge porn victims are women. I know you're stunned. Uh, 93% said they have suffered significantly emotional distress due to being a victim. And 49% said that they have been harassed or stalked online by users who saw their material. So you, now you're not just being stalked by your ex. You've got a whole wide world of the internet ready to come at you and every troll wants to throw his negativity into this mix. So one of the more famous examples of revenge porn that's happened in the last year or two is uh, in July 2017, Rob Kardashian Jr., Kim's brother, posted a series of nude photos of his daughter's mother, Black China, during their breakup of their tumultuous relationship. In September 2017, Black China sued Kardashian seeking a million dollars, claiming that the nude pictures lost her several modeling contracts. This will more than likely get settled out of court and quietly with a non-disclosure agreement. But the reality here is he's mad at her for whatever she did. So instead of dealing with it like a grown adult who understands that sometimes relationships don't work out, he goes ahead and posts a bunch of nude pictures of her on the internet. Now, not all of us have the last name of Kardashian, but even if your last name is Smith, Jones, or Robinson, you know, the reality is that these pictures are going to be out there forever. And it is unfair to the woman and their child to have this happen. Foolishness. As an example of non-consensual pornography, in 2014, at age 23, that's very young, actress Jennifer Lawrence's iCloud account was hacked. An erotic photo she had taken and sent to her boyfriend, Nicholas Holt, were stolen and posted on a 4chan site. Despite the capture and conviction of the person who committed the theft, Lawrence is still reminded of how far the picture spread. Quote, you can be just at a barbecue and somebody can just pull out their phone and pull them up. That's really an impossible thing to process. And that's from an interview in The Hollywood Reporter in 2017. So, you know, she makes a good point. When you are young, 18 to 24, we oftentimes do things that we're not always proud of. That's part of growing up. And because she is a celebrity, because she has made... Um, a gazillion movies, you know, she was targeted and the pictures, uh, and I don't post these because I don't want to perpetuate any sense that this is okay, were, were not even that overwhelmingly provocative. It was just the point that something she meant for her boyfriend, which most people have done in, you know, at least if they're under 40 or 50, have sent a picture of their boobs or whatever, that's for her boyfriend. It's not for the whole world to see. And now the whole world gets to see it. In recent years, she said that once her pictures were spread all over the internet, she realized that she shouldn't worry about doing nude scenes because everybody's already seen everything, which is quite a cynical perspective for anyone. So moving on to slut shaming. Slut shaming is the action or fact of stigmatizing a woman for engaging in behavior judged to be promiscuous or sexually provocative. Director of the Women's Media Center Speech Project, Soroya Chamelez, expanded the definition. It's embarrassing, insulting, or otherwise denigrating a girl or woman for her real or extrapolated sexual behavior, including for dressing in a sexual way having sexual feelings, and or exploring and exhibiting them. Slut shaming imposes a double standard in which men can engage in sexual behavior freely, whereas women can only do it when it's part of a deal that includes true love and or marriage. So you will oftentimes see a woman who makes a serious point, especially on Twitter, and some of the responses from guys just really raunchy, inappropriate, completely off-topic stuff. And it seems like it's an easy way to insult women by calling them a slut, when if you called a guy a slut, he would be proud of that. 
but society has deemed female sluts as being a negative. In September 2017, performer Amber Rose, that's her on the right, uh, wrote an essay for Marie Claire's website which addressed how she had been slut shamed since she was a girl due to how she dressed and behaved. After she became a celebrity, the name calling escalated on social media, especially on Instagram. She responded to the name by name calling by creating the slut walk, which um, in 2018 is in its third or fourth year already, which highlights modern day feminism and women's rights. And this was based on her desire to reclaim the word slut and turn it into a badge of honor instead of shame. So does she wear short skirts? Sure. Does she wear tight clothing? Sure. Does she wear high heels? Sure. But why does that make her a slut? And that's really her whole point. But on the internet, again, you have these trolls who just don't have any semblance of understanding about their own place in society and so instead want to denigrate others to make themselves feel better and bigger and stronger. Moving on, we have sextortion. It is defined as blackmail in which so sexual information or images are used to extort sex, pictures, and or money from the victim. This online blackmail is often conducted by sophisticated organized criminal networks operating out of business-like locations similar to call centers. And this is very big in Russia, in um, some of the other countries that you see in um, uh, Pakistan, but again remember the largest places that do these things it's all in the US. It is similar to cyber coercion but sextortion tends to focus on children and teens. The targets of this exploitation are often children ranging in age from 8 to 17. And you know you got to keep in mind that most kids before their age 8 are not going to be allowed to be on their tablet or cell phone alone but around 8 or 9 kids start to pull away from that parental oversight. 78% of the victims are girls. 10% we don't know what gender they are because it was un not determined and 12% are boys. This occurs most commonly via a cell phone or a tablet with messaging and social media apps and video chats. The perpetrator usually finds or meets the child in a public forum such as a game chat and then after grooming the child, i.e. finding out names, ages, locations, the offender will push the child to move to a private chat area or begin direct messaging. The offender threatens to post previously acquired sexual content online, which is 67% of the time, as well as specifically threatening to post it in a place for family and friends to see, 29% if the child does not comply. Other tactics include reciprocation. I'll send you my pictures if you send me yours. Secretly recording explicit video chats pretending to be of a similar age. Using multiple identities to assure the child. Threatening harm to the child or their family if their demands are not met. One of the most common manipulation techniques is to pretend to be a representative of a modeling or talent firm because, you know, at that age, 12, 13, 14, one of the things that we all have in mind is to become a superstar where you want to be that person on TV. So here's an example of sex torsion. This is from 20, 2007 to 2010. Lucas Michael Chancellor, that's that guy in the picture, targeted nearly 350 young girls in his sextortion ploy. So many that after his arrest, the FBI launched a prolonged online campaign to locate the scores of girls whom he had victimized. He pretended to be a teenage boy and asked his victims to strip on camera. Once he had the pictures or videos, he threatened to release the material to the victim's family 
unless they continue to send him explicit pictures and videos, which he then distributed to child pornographers for a nice tidy sum. So there's a uh, screenshot of a conversation he said. Do you know there is a video of you showing your privates? And the person responds, I've never done that. And he responds, do you want to see it? And she says, no thanks. And he responds, well, there's a good chance it's going to be sent to your MySpace friends. So obviously, you know, it was from several years ago. But again, this idea of threatening someone by revealing their sexual uh, genitalia to the world. I mean, that is just horrifying. And yet, you know, this is a common thing. 97% of people who sex tort are men. And again, it's this idea that, you know, whatever they can't get in the real world, they're going to go after in the cyber world. So moving on to online child pornography is defined by federal law as any visual depiction of sexually explicit conduct involving a person under the age of 18 years old. Federal law prohibits the producing, distributing, importing, receiving, or possessing any image of child pornography. According to the Association of Sites Advancing Child Protection, child pornography is usually distributed two ways. It's either commercial child pornography that is distributed for profit or non-commercial child pornography that is offered free or traded among offenders like the peer-to-peer -peer networks. A 2016 study by the Center for Court Innovation found that between 8,900 and 10,500 children ages 13 to 17 are commercially exploited each year in the United States. Keep in mind that does not include the children who are being commercially exploited between the ages of one years old, and I'm not kidding on that one, to 12. So here is one of the more famous examples of child pornography uh, cropping up. Mark Salling, who was an actor who played Puck on the TV show Glee, was arrested in 2015. He was indicted for receiving and possessing 50,000 pornographic images of prepubescent children, that's ages 10 to 13, on his computer. So here you have a guy who is fairly good looking, who is famous, who has money, and he went ahead and did this. So he had a plea agreement where he would serve seven years in jail, but in February 2018 he decided to do us all a favor and committed suicide. I'm sorry that sounded cruel, but you know, it's, it's, there's no reason for anyone to have 50,000 images of 11 and 10 year old kids on their computer. Um, k killed themselves at 35. Here's another example of child pornography, which uh, he is not quite as handsome as you can tell, but after a three-year investigation, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security led to the apprehension of 54 predators, including Jeffrey Portway of Massachusetts in 2013. By the way, he was arrested in Florida. Uh, a forensic examination of his computer revealed over 4,500 exchanges of child pornography with others and around 20,000 images and videos of child pornography, much of which depicted sexual violence. In 26, September 2013, Portway agreed to a 26-year sentence in federal prison. So 26 years is a significant amount of time but what you're going to see is that the vast majority of these folks don't end up serving the you know the majority of their time they know how to act they are behaving themselves because their whole goal is to get out of prison so they can continue with their personal predilection for this kind of behavior then we have cyber sex trafficking and it involves the live sexual abuse of children mostly under the age of 10 
It is streamed via the internet and pedophiles anywhere in the world pay to watch and direct the abuse. Victims can be exploited in any location with a computer, the internet, and a webcam, or even just a mobile phone. In 2013, three girls from the Philippines testified against Jeffrey Herschel of Pennsylvania who regularly visited an internet site that showed live sex shows that forced young girls to act out customers' fantasies, according to U.S. investigators. The three girls were eight years old when it occurred. He was sentenced to 12 years in federal prison. And there is a picture of the three girls who testified against Herschel with their identities obscured. Now, let's talk about this. Did he actually touch them? No. But he was participating in an activity where they were being molested. So 12 years may seem, again, a little harsh or a little light, depending on your perspective. But, you know, again, these folks, they just want to get back out so that they can continue with this kind of behavior. So what is being done to combat cyber sex crimes? In next week's lecture, we will examine some of the laws being used to prevent the ongoing victimization of individuals on the Internet. Government agencies, non-governmental agencies, nonprofits, and individuals are making significant efforts to stop these crimes. But as technology continues to spread to all aspects of our lives, can crime prevention even keep up? And that's really the question that we're going to be asking throughout this entire class is what can be done to head off the folks who are truly creating the uh, environment that makes cyber sex crimes a possibility. Here's some work cited in case you want to read any of the information that I have provided to you in this. There's another set of it. I know, work excited, don't you love it? Anyway, so if you have any questions, please text or email me. If you are not in my class but you still have a question, please leave me a comment and I will respond as quickly as I can. Have a fantastic day. Thank you.